Carol ready. <laughs> okay. Three. Point. Two, one. Welcome, welcome back, everybody. I think if I'm pointing right, you are on Facebook and you are on YouTube. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. I'm Gary Edelman with a bevy of special guests again, rounding out our first day at Gettysburg 156. Today, we're going to talk about commanders, military commanders, mostly Civil War, but we're going to go back in time and forward in time from there as well. I'm really happy to be joined by Carol here. That's all the introduction she needs, but I'll say Carol Reardon, author, former Penn State, all sorts of other things. You should know her if you don't. Doug Dowds, U.S. Uh, uh, US Army War College, licensed battlefield guide, U.S. Marine Corps, Wayne Mott, CEO of the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and I'll bet you he's got some cool stuff with us today a little bit. Um, here we are on Stevens Knoll at Gettysburg, but we're going to broaden things out. But just to jump into things a little bit, behind me is Henry Warner Slocum. On the first day of the battle, although he's the second highest ranking guy at Gettysburg on the first day of the battle, and, and overall, actually, he's really the highest ranking one, He's just the sixth commander on the field to take command of the whole Union Army um, uh, during that time. It starts out with maybe Buford, then it's Reynolds, then it's Doublesday, then it's a couple others, and then it's him. How does all this stuff work? What's up with the ranks? Who did they base their philosophies on? Let's start and go back to the beginning. American Revolution, George Washington. So where it always should start is George Washington. And of course, he's going to go ahead and influence how all these commanders on these Civil War battlefields act, in part because he is going to constantly ask for, I need a professional army led by professional professional officers. This can't be a part-time activity. And so what comes out of this really is two big things. One, in 1794, the Army's going to establish the branches of the artillery and the engineers. And of course, we know in the American Civil War, many of these senior commanders come through West Point as artillerists and engineers. The other thing that's going to happen is, because of his influence, in 1802, we're going to establish the United States Military Academy at West Point. This is going to drive, all of a sudden now, the profession of arms in the United States of America, where there are lifelong learners dedicated to waging war on behalf of the nation. But only to a point because we come up to the War of 1812 and we have not just one, but two major military figures that come out of that war. One, of course, is Winfield Scott, and he becomes the commander of the United States Army on the, the uh, eve of the Civil War, and we know what he wants. He, has, he was commissioned too early to have really uh, gone to West Point and enjoyed that kind of professional development, but he caught the fever, and he really uh, developed his own professional knowledge with by building a big library. He liked to quote from one author to another. He probably was a really boring dinner companion, <laughs> but that's what he liked to do an awful lot. On the other hand, you had Andrew Jackson, the hero of New Orleans, and the man who, whose name lent itself to Jacksonian democracy. He was the one who basically said anybody can be whatever it is they want to be. And so between the two of them, Scott and Jackson, what we have setting up by the time of the Civil War are two schools of thought about who can lead armies. Those who say you had to uh, have experience, you had to go to West Point, you had to have professional training, and those who would say, like Jackson, you know, Jackson didn't have the benefit of that, and he did all right, but common sense and just some kind of a genius for war would be sufficient to, in order to lead armies into battle. Very cool. Before I move it over to Wayne here, man, it's good to see so many good friends here. And as soon as we go live, there's a bunch of you on already. Um, we've got Pittsburgh, shouting out to Chris White behind the camera there. We've got Maryland. We've got a French Confederate over in France at the time right now. Right. Hope you're watching some soccer. Sorry about what happened in case that bothers you. Um, you know, we've got Detroit. We've got uh, my friend, our good friend, Uli Bauman. Um, and we've got all sorts of other friends with us. Larry Swader, Timothy York. Um, somebody wants a tour with you, Doug. Get in line. There's a lot of people like that already. And as we go along, so it's interesting that America America's pretty fortunate to have Washington and Scott right off the bat, and Scott's still around when we go to the Mexican War in the 1840s. Yeah, that's right, Gary, and one of the things that both Doug and Carol mentioning here, we're covering about 70 years of time <laughs> in about two minutes uh, worth of time. We're here. actually way behind. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in the Mexican War, that's fought between 1846 and 1848, and these young officers who are now graduates of West Point, a product of professional military education, are the ones serving under Winfield Scott. If you go to the, in the camp campaigns in Mexico City, and also future President Zachary Taylor, if you're in the northern part uh, of uh, Mexico in, in, in the Texas area. And think about the camaraderie that's there as well, not just the professional training experience that they're going to get on the battlefields, but the 8th U.S. Infantry, you've got Pickett and Longstreet in that same regiment. The 6th U.S. Infantry, you got Simon Buckner, Winfield Scott Hancock, Lewis Armstead, and we can go all the way down the list of the folks that were there. So this is going to be the proving ground 15 years before the Civil War, where the 
these officers that become general officers in the Civil War are learning their tactical craft on the battlefield and what a valuable experience it's going to be for them too. Yeah, and that's a great thing, you know, because people are writing about this, right? Carol, you know, you got people writing out it, you've got the budding U.S. Military Academy, but who are some of the real influencers coming out of world military stuff? Who's your, who's your guy? Well, the guy who I ended up writing about was a man by the name of Henri Jomini. And uh, Jomini, of course, served on Napoleon's staff. Now, he was not the only person writing. There were literally tons of people writing about how Napoleon won or how not to lose to Napoleon or something like that. <laughs> and, but, of course, we, we've all, always focused on this one guy by the name of Jomini. And it was his works, among others, that got into the uh, curriculum up at West Point to the point where Civil War historians for generations started saying that we were imbued with Jominian traditions and Jominian ideas. What we forgot to point out was during the 1850s, Jefferson Davis led a committee from the United States Senate up to review the curriculum of the, of the uh, United States Military Academy. And the first thing they found, found out was that every instructor at West Point hated Jominy. It was a terrible textbook. You could that didn't like it. Perhaps Donna didn't read it, and that's all there was to it. And the second thing they did out was we don't have a replacement for it. And so what we have is a situation where there's an interest in theory, but we don't have a body of theory on which we can really, really draw. So all of a sudden when we're confronted with a civil war that's larger in scale and scope than anything we've ever dealt with before, we don't have that strong foundation on which to build that we sort of wish we had. So it becomes really interesting, to, to Carol's point, because where all these other people are out there, it's not that we're not trying to get around it. You know, during those interwar years, 110 officers make over 150 trips to Europe. They're all trying to figure out what are the latest developments going on there. They bring all that knowledge back to the United States, and ultimately what you have is this adaptation or Americanization of what they're doing in Europe, knowing we can't apply it fully here in the United States. And so their ability to try and try and make practical some of the theoretical things that are taking place in Europe is also part of this generation and the leaders that would lead these armies. One of them was, was, was George McClellan, by the way. And McClellan, he goes over to the Crimea. He's one of a tr team of three. And when the team of three came back, each wrote his own report about what he saw and what influenced him. If you take a look at what McClellan wrote, the two things that always jump out is, number one, he talked more about cavalry than the other arms. Which arm do we usually not associate with George McClellan? <laughs> cavalry. Interesting. And the second thing that he wrote about when he was talking about military maneuvers that impressed him the most, it was a Russian withdrawal. <laughs> that should unnerve you a little bit, too. <laughs> you know, well, did he call it a withdrawal or did he call it changing did his change base? His base? <laughs> <laughs> no, he called it a withdrawal. <laughs> So, but therein is even an interesting idea of how does that culture that takes place over Mexico, you know, we often think about Ulysses S. Grant as kind of the poster child for the anti-intellectualism in the United States Army. But while he goes to command a regiment at the very beginning of the war, he writes his wife and says, please send him the report that McClellan wrote from the Crimean War, which means that Ulysses S. Grant acquired the report while he was out of the army, had read it so he knew its contents. It is a complete reflection of that idea of education makes the man, something that he would have learned at West Point that, you know, those 336 future general officers learn in Mexico. And Doug, I think it's important to remember not only are these, you know, these young officers in combat in Mexico, but they're learning things, let's say, being a quartermaster. What did Grant do? He has to understand what supply is, and supply is such a huge part of these campaigns. Grant is learning that very early. He spent most of his military career in, in that position, and he understands it. So without those kind of things, you don't even get to the battlefield. And Grant is one of those that adapts these lessons, not just on the battlefield, but how do we get to a battlefield? Great and point. we're going we're gonna to get back to Grant in a second because, uh, well, we have a good reason to do that. But just real quick, you're with the American Battlefield Trust on YouTube and Facebook. Share those with your friends on Facebook or tell your friends to subscribe to the American Battlefield Trust YouTube channel. we got to get those numbers way up. We were a little late to that game, but we're rocking now. Let me just say, uh, uh, Alabama, Florida, Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C., Texas, Mississippi, and Georgia are all watching. The Southerners have surged back on this, so bring your Yankee friends along. Let's even this out a little bit more. I see a couple of you have been watching the Little Wars TV. Um, uh, Battle of Gettysburg uh, video. This is when we refought the Battle of Gettysburg under your orders um, uh, a couple of months ago. That video is live on Little Wars TV. Check that out if you can. We got Cincinnati. We got Amber Lass watching today and Larry Swader. Those are both people you should know. My good friend Jamie Reif and several members of the American Battlefield Trust. If you're not a member of the Trust, just start to check us out. Go to battlefields.org. Learn a little bit about what we do. We have a lot of pure educational stuff and of course we're always trying to save land such as right now at Gettysburg and at Stones River and Uncle 
confirmed reports suggest that maybe before long at a state further to the west where they sell and make a lot of bourbon, um, <laughs> we might have something, something out there soon. And hello to to John O'Donnell's. Now, before we move in and get back to Grant, I just want to get into this a little bit because, you know, it's interesting to take the Revolutionary War and watch how the American Army patterned itself after the British Army, but then the U.S. Army, uh, you know, in the Civil War versus the Confederate Army, there's a lot of differences, and I'd like to get into who's really in charge. I mean, the Confederate government started with five full generals. This is them, and this is the order they're in. What is it? Uh, Cooper, Johnston, Lee, Johnston, Beauregard. That's it. In the U.S. Army, but you didn't get any higher than Major General, so it was a little bit less clear. Went back to date of, you know, sort of promotion. So anything to say about this? Doug, do you want to you want to start? Or you well, wanna... so I'll jump in only because yeah. while we sit here yeah. at Gettysburg, it is an utter reflection of this notion that they don't have the rank of th a three star until we get to March of 1864 when we get back to Grant. Yeah. So anytime we got in the middle of a battlefield, we'd all get up on a hill and we'd go, "Oh man, who's in charge?" We'd all look and go, "Hey, we're all two stars. That's awesome." Well, I got promoted last week, and you got promoted last month, and you were two months ago, and you were three. Right. You're in charge, and it was pure seniority. It didn't reflect talent. It didn't necessarily reflect expertise in whatever area you were in. So uh, when Meade is given command of the Army of the Potomac three days before we fight the battle, the one unique authority he's given is he's allowed to ignore seniority. And so that gives him all kind of powers on this field to employ younger Corps commanders like Winfield Scott Hancock, Hancock the Superb, uh, that he uses to great effect on this battlefield. Let's remember, Doug, that the the average age of a Union general and Confederate general in the Civil War about 40, and all the generals in, in the United States uh, at the outbreak of the American Civil War, they're over 70. Uh, Winfield Scott being commissioned in 1808. Think about that. 1808 is when he received his commission, and it's 1861 when the Civil War breaks out. So, so. most of the generals <laughs> who rise to command during the, the four years of the Civil War begin the war as a captain. Right. Right. <laughs> Think about that, making making the jump from captain to brigadier literally overnight in, in some cases. Yeah. Well, and so it was brought it's up. It's a pretty amazing thing. You brought up about the whole idea of scope and scale is so far beyond what anybody envisions. Every time we talk about, oh, well, they didn't go to West Point before. Even if you were Winfield Scott and you commanded 14,000 men at the campaign to take Mexico City, that's not even the size of a corps in the Civil War. The whole army is only 16,000 strong at the beginning. That's not the size of a corps. This is so much beyond the scope and scale for which anybody is prepared to operate or lead at. It's an entirely new challenge. Cool. So, man, just people just keep on stepping on, so I feel like i got to say it. We got Utah, Tennessee, West Jordan. I assume you mean the country. <laughs> Check that out. West Virginia, Ohio, Washington, and three people have mentioned Winfield Scott Hancock so far. My man. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely get back to him as well. Let me just say that we're covering commanders now. This is new for us. Uh, usually we go to a place and we talk about that place. Now we're kind of doing it topically. We did civilians earlier this morning. We kind of did battle strategy and tactics before that um, or after that. And we did um, earlier, we did, you know, sort of battlefields themselves. Let us know what you think about that. Do you like this format? Do you like us sitting down? Do you love when our camera, you know, sort of cuts out because we're walking too far away from a cell tower? Let us know about those things. Um, also, I'll encourage you, if you want to see Little Round Top, Culp's Hill, Spangler Spring, the first day's field, Barlow's Knoll, everything like that, go to our last two years of videos where we did this stuff like crazy. We're not inclined to do the same thing year after year. Um, and let me just say while you're at it, because you can't get enough, it's time. We've just updated our Gettysburg Battle app. It's free on Google Play or on the App Store, uh, especially the App Store one has a lot of new features so download the Gettysburg Battle app where we cover the whole battle of Gettysburg with videos and things at where you're standing geolocated and all sorts of other things like this now make sure you share this with your friends before we back in let's get into the Civil War a little bit more here so let's start to talk about commanders that we like for whatever reason just jump on in oh I, first of all I think the greatest and I hate to say it maybe I'll be bold but in the Union Army totally unsung hero. He's gotten some recent press, and that's Montgomery Meigs. Let's think about Montgomery Meigs. Let's think about this man who's running this bureau down in Washington, D.C., and he's got to supply these hundreds of thousands of Union soldiers in the Civil War, and the Army starts out at 16,000 men, and he expands that capability, and he does it really well, and there's no compatibility there, I think, over on the Confederate side. So let's not think just about these combat leaders. Let's think about the people that are there yeah. that are out supplying these troops, because you got to get bullets and bread to the battlefield. You have to, to have a battle in the Civil War. Wayne's dead on right. One of the things that we do when we do a lot of our staff rides is we focus, We don't just keep all of our focus on the senior commander. What helps him do his job the best? In my mind, I have an image of General Meade on the morning of the 28th uh, of June going to General Hooker's headquarters and watching General Hooker and his personal staff get on their horses and leave, and he's probably going, bye. <laughs> you know. But then he looks to see who's left and he probably gets a grim smile on his face because it's people like 
Seth Williams, an adjutant general. Rufus Engels. Rufus Engels. Who yeah. kicks butt and takes names. <laughs> Nobody, every commander of the Army of the Potomac keeps him on. And Grant will embrace him as well. You don't get a better quartermaster general than that. Marcina Patrick, who's crusty as all get out, but for a provost marshal general, that's who you want in charge. Uh, Governor Warren is your chief engineer. When, and Henry Hunt is your chief of artillery. For as much as is now on General Meade's plate, he also has to breathe a small sigh of relief because he has a team that is, well, that's a bit of a dream team right there. It's not just who's commander, but who's backing him up. That's an awesome team. So then think about how prepared, so that, you, you know, I always come back around, come back around to General Meade and go, how ready is he to take command? If you think about it, go back through all the stuff we've just talked about. You know, when Meade graduates from West Point, he's an artillerist. He goes and fights the Seminole War as an artillerist. He gets out of the Army and becomes a civil engineer. Gets back in the Army as an engineer. Serves on both Taylor and Scott's staff during the Mexican War. So he's a staff officer. Spends time in the Ordnance Bureau. When the war starts, he becomes an infantry commander, goes from brigade up to corps and grand division command. He's served in every Every branch of the Army, with the exception of the cavalry, when the day he's given command, you could argue nobody's been more prepared to take that position and assume that staff than George Gordon Meade. Really interesting. Good. I see some people coming on here. We've got a uh, Patrick Claiborne fan or two, Kentucky, New York. We got a YouTube question about, uh, you know, why isn't Von Clausewitz catching on among people? I don't know if you want to address that or just skip that. Look at that camera. If you, if you look at Civil War generals and what they wrote and who they wrote about, you're going to see a number of mentions of Germany and some others. The only Civil War general who I've ever found who even mentions Clausewitz is Henry Halleck, old brains himself. <laughs> when he wrote his Elements of, of Military Art and Science, he included a, a brief bio, a bibliography of sources that he thought uh, were really interesting. He put Archduke Charles of Austria as his number one choice, <laughs> and Germany was in the top couple. Clausewitz gets named way down and below, but if you read his entire book, he never cites Clausewitz as a source for any point that he ever makes. Clausewitz, when it, he pops into discussions about the Civil War, it's the stuff that we've put in in more modern times. Yeah. It's not part of what the Civil War generation talks and about. Is, I, I, and Carol, tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm not sure it was translated. What year was it translated, the first? I mean, it was. It probably wasn't easily found, right? Because it's in yeah. German and most of the not, cadets yeah, are it, teaching it's French. It's not in English yet. Right. Okay, yeah. so that, that's a good answer right there. Yeah. Maybe they're not using it because <laughs> it's not in English yet. Really good. So we've, man, we've got some, now we've got some strong Vincent fans. We've got some Forrest fans. Neither of those are particularly surprising. Now, what I find interesting, too, is that it's so hard for us reading about Civil War to humanize these people, right? Because when you brought up Montgomery Miggs, when I think of him, I don't think of, man, that guy's capable in every way. I think of, like, God, he's that guy I kind of want on my team, but I don't want to have any contact with him because he's like a pain in the rear. These people are like that. I mean, you know how hard it is to like George McClellan? And isn't that one of the reasons we seem to think that because he did certain things we don't like that he was bad at everything, when in fact, he was great at a lot of things, a whole lot of things. You try to run an army, um, you know, and try to do that really well and then try to fight it well. Yeah, so if you think about it, so you take the strengths of what he's good at. Of course, he builds the Army of the Potomac. That's the structure that's going to exist to the end of the war. Even if we take somebody like Joseph Hooker, if we think about the reforms he makes after Fredericksburg, but before Chancellorsville, it's literally Army of the Potomac's Valley Forge. They go through that, and that is the iron hand that, although they suffer at Chancellorsville, that ultimately wins here at, at uh, Gettysburg. And so when you think about the individual skills that they bring to organize or to make better uh, the training, how they handle uh, furloughs, all of that administrative stuff necessary to run an army, some of them are very good at. Exactly. And one of the things that we're ta what we're talking about here is a commonality throughout military uh, officer corps throughout all times and all military cultures. Every time you deal with a brother officer or a sister officer now, you are taking their measure and you're thinking about them right now. You're thinking about their courage, their character, their competence. And at some point in the future, if you need them, you sort of already have a mental checklist that you've used for each one of these things. Think about somebody like George Marshall who kept his own little book on all kinds of individuals, and that helps to explain why he reached way down into the ranks to pull a Dwight D. Eisenhower up and get him ready for World War II. Think about, well, there's a, an officer who, um, he, he, was, he never rose above the rank of major, but he kept, a, he kept tabs, in, mostly in letters that he wrote to his wife about various officers he met while out doing staff rides and things like that. And he nailed this one guy and, and just said, I never want to serve with this guy. Every time we stop in the evening and set up camp, 
he always steals the tent pegs. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be something big that can form your professional relate uh, your professional opinion of a brother officer. Right. Don't steal tent pegs. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to be with somebody that's greedy or a thief. Um, what was I going to say, man? Do we got some some real uh, mystery going on here? Hashtag What's in Wayne Mott's hand? Hashtag Got the gloves on? What is in Wayne Mott's hand? Everybody. I'm curious. What is Wayne holding right now? We're going to tell you this hour at some point when we get back Stay. to it. You're with the you're, you're with the American Battlefield Trust on Facebook and YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us. We're with Wayne Mott's of the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Carol Reardon and Doug Dowds, and I'm glad you're back. Man, are you all engaging right now? We see just comments. We can't remotely keep up with them, but we have some Alexander Hayes fans, some Armistead fans, some John Bell Hood fans, some George Sears Green fans. Man, we got a lot of fans from the East, a few from the West. Let's keep talking. I'm not sure which one Hood is, but um, let's move on here because I do want to talk about U.S. Grant. You know, is, is he in the right place? I mean, is it just an obvious thing, or could anyone have done his job at the end of the war? And then I want to walk on to what is in Wayne's hand. So, anyone want to capture that? Is 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 Grant the unique American to get that job done at the end? So, I, I, here's one of the things I think that is unique about Grant. Certainly at the start of the war, Grant has failed. Whereas we see a lot of these other generals, we were talking about McClellan. McClellan has only ever known success from the moment he goes to the West Point to the time he's leading a railroad before the war starts. But Grant has suffered. He has failed. He knows what it is to have fallen short. And when the war comes, he recognizes this is his one small opportunity to try and make things right. And he never, never gives up on that idea. So that when he sees small windows of opportunity on the battlefield, having, having failed, having seen what it was like to uh, fall short, short in civilian life and even in his first opportunity in the army he does not miss his opportunity he is dogged in his pursuit of success and he will not fail he will not look back and i think his ability to go ahead and rise above perhaps all others to start to think about this war in terms of running campaigns the synchronizing events and time space and purpose all the way across the nation makes him truly a unique individual in the civil war very cool. So, what, what, anything to add on Grant? He's had a, a chance to evaluate his strengths and weaknesses over decades, and when it comes, when push comes to shove, he has the persistence, the tenacity, and the very quiet self-confidence to make his decisions and stick with them. He's not one of these people who will pick up an idea and run with it because of the last person he talked to. He has some good ideas in his mind, and he's going to work through them. And even more, he's going to convince others to follow him. It's interesting, you might hear, you hear some rumors about a major documentary about U.S. Grant coming out, about a major motion picture with Leo DiCaprio coming out as Grant or something like that. Uh, we'll have to see how that goes. So, uh, Wayne, let's see let's see what you have, say, on the bottom that you're holding right there. Yes, let's, uh, let's start with that, Gary. And, and, and <laughs> we'll, we'll look for direction from Chris or James as to whether you're supposed to walk up, because we got two okay. cameras here. So, um, see what you got and start talking about well, it. Well, I want to say, when you talk about Grant, all the things that we've said about him, now we're 150 years uh, after him, and I think it's hard for us to put him as a man, U.S. Grant has to eat. So from the collection of the National Civil War Museum, I think they all do. in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, we have a spoon, and this is actually inscribed to Grant. You tell me where you want me to go here, Chris. I'll, you want to hold it? You want to pull it up against there? And this spoon would have been part of, one of, of General Grant's mess kit, and this one we actually have an affidavit on that said it was given to Grant by President Lincoln for Robert Lincoln, because Robert or uh, Robert Grant, uh, uh, Robert Lincoln, when Robert Lincoln served on Grant's staff, so it was given to Grant because Robert Lincoln is serving on Grant's staff. That's and officers cool. have to, that you know, is. they have to buy their own things. You're an officer; you're not issued any any types of utensils or anything like that to eat on. So this would have been a personal thing that Grant would have used. There would have been a knife and a fork uh, with this as well. I like that. It kind of humanizes the guy. The guy needs to eat. That's really yeah. cool. Now, um, and, and it kind of reminds me, like, you know, whoever got this spoon, maybe they were hoping for a gun. You know, <laughs> or some, a revolver or something like that. But, you, know, you know, what is yeah. it that Stephen, Stephen Douglas <laughs> said to Abe Lincoln, if I can't be president, at least I can hold his hat. Maybe the person right. who got the spoon, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I would rather have the gun, but right. at least that. I can get the spoon. Yeah. Pretty cool. Well, while we Gotcha, Wayne. What, what else are you holding there, well, and, and whose is it? I brought these on purpose because not only do you have to eat, but you got to drink too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I brought along. I'll let you hold this, Gary, while well, I put it I down. Get up. You, you, want, you, want, you don't need gloves. It's in a case. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this is a flask. Every Civil War officer has to have a flask, and this is a flask that belonged to General George Crook. Crook, a native Buckeye like myself, was born in 1828 around 
Dayton, Ohio, graduated from West Point, 1852, and a fellow officer with U.S. Grant in the Pacific Northwest in the 4th U.S. Infantry. And during the Civil War, he's commanding out in West Virginia. After the American Civil War, of course, he's going to be the chief U.S. officer in charge of the Department of Arizona tracking down Geronimo. And he dies in 1890, and he's buried in Arlington National Cemetery right outside Robert E. Lee's front door. But this is his actual flask, and it has cavalry. He was a member of the 6th United States Cavalry Regiment. It's right here on the back. Is there anything in it, Wayne? No, there's nothing in it, but as hot as it was today, Carol, I thought about putting stuff in it. <laughs> I can tell you that. Well, let me just say, we're really thankful to our friends at the uh, National Civil War Museum because we're going to take this spoon out. We're all going to take a spoonful of honey from it in just a minute. So thank you so much. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> That's why I got it in a little Riker box, Gary, <laughs> just so nobody does it. But, you know, on behalf of the museum, I just want to say thanks for, you know, partnering with us to be out there. And we hope some of the, the viewers and listeners will go over to the Civil War Museum, National Civil War Museum's Facebook page and like us and follow us and look at some of these things. Cool, very cool. Sure. Uh, we love this. You're with the American Battlefield Trust on YouTube and on Facebook. And uh, man, we got a lot of you here. I'm, I forgot, I've been <laughs> failing to mention Timothy York. Uh, he runs Gettysburg Discussion Group for Overly Sensitive People. And that's sarcastic. <laughs> you might not be able to get into that group, especially if you are overly sensitive. So keep that in mind. Welcome, Tim. Good to see you, man. Uh, and we've also got some fans of John Singleton Mosby, uh, of course, John Buford, James Longstreet, August Willick. Wow, you're getting obscure wow. there. Whoa. James Birdsey McPherson, George Sharp, and Evander Law. What is Law's middle name? McKeever. There you go. Whoa. Oh, nice. Well Whoa. done. <laughs> Citadel grad nonetheless. Okay, so here we are. So we've been talking about some of our favorite commanders. I don't know if we got very far yet, but I like talking about the reverse. Those people that, man, you actually do realistically think that either you could have done better as, or they had someone that could have done better. And I always lead with James Ledley because he is my least favorite commander. He was a no shirker and a drunk. Um, you know, and yet, and, and of course, his last battle was the crater, but not before he led his men into the mule, mule shoe at Spotsylvania, out at Cold Harbor, along the Brock Road um, at, at Wilderness. It's just deadly. You want to learn about how bad he is, read A Mother May You Never See the Sights I've Seen, um, an incredible <laughs> regimental book. How about some other people that you maybe that would have been better off commanding less? So at the highest levels, as much as we want to give credit to Ulysses S. Grant, John Pemberton seems to be a man who's well over his skis when it comes to the level at which he's been asked to command. Uh, I know he's, a, he's, he's fighting for the South, although he's a Pennsylvanian, so we barely know he's on our side. But besides that, uh, he, he just seems to be utterly overwhelmed. Now, it might be the genius of Grant and his maneuvers, but he just never seems to be able to get his arms around the forces that he does have available with the mission that he has, which is a defensive one. So he has nearly equal numbers, a defensible mission, and he just always comes up short. So Pemberton falls on my short list. Yeah. Come on, guys, don't be shy. You, There's Carol, people you don't Carol, like. Are you a Bragg fan? <laughs> Justice McKinstry. Let's go for the... Okay, you got to tell us who that is. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? Union general, served out in Kentucky and Tennessee, manages to avoid most um, dangerous situations, seems to have looked at the, ar at the Army as a way to uh, personally enrich himself, seems particularly fond of tea sets, among other things, and seems to be just stay that far ahead of the, uh, the, the, the law in the whole time. Uh, just a complete waste of a general star. Right, Wayne, I, I, I think it's I think you've got to say former Secretary of War John Floyd, uh, certainly at, at uh, Fort Donelson, leaving you know leaving these folks out there and holding the bag, wasn't it at Fort Donelson? <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, that's and he no left Buckner in charge. Right? I mean, so here here's a guy that decides not to take the responsibility for surrender, but I think it's the number three man there that it sounds like Cornwallis at Yorktown too, or something like that. So uh, certainly Floyd is high on my list. And, and Gideon of, Pillow can sit next to him. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Sit next to him, right? right. Um, yeah. So we got some. Finally, someone from my home state of Illinois. Welcome uh, as we go, and we've got some fans or detractors of Chamberlain Wright Kemper. I'm sorry, Kemper. If you're watching <laughs> the Gettysburg movie, um, Granger Butler and Rosecrans as well. Good to hear from all of y'all as well. So now let's get into real quick the dream team scenario. You know, your favorite. You can pick any of them, your favorite cavalry commander, your favorite artillery commander from any era, as long as it's pre 1900s. Um, your favorite artillery. Uh, you know, Signal Corps, Army Commander, Tactical Commander, who do you got? I'll lead with E. Porter Alexander for artillery. How about that? 
Mm, that's pretty. I'm good. not a big yeah. hunt fan. You're not. You don't like, really. You, you yeah. Know. No, I always feel hunt is always just my rank's not high enough. I don't have enough men. I don't. You know, he never complains about being less likely to be killed. But he was right about every well, every bit of that. <laughs> Except <laughs> arguing with Hancock. He should have never been. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Great cavalry. Uh, I think Phil Sheridan. Sir, I think uh, Phil yeah. Sheridan certainly has to be on that list. Yeah, he, as a. Cavalry as a cavalry, cavalry officer, yeah. I think yeah. Phil Sheridan certainly has got to be on, 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 on definitely on that list. Who's, uh, who's your top brigade commander? Oh. Yeah, I mean, there are so many generals that... That, that stayed in brigade. Well the his... problem is, you got. Are we talking about those that were brigade commanders? Certainly, I would say the best division commander, and everybody will, will laugh. But it's John Bell Hood. I think John Bell Hood yeah. is fantastic when he's at the level that you know and that that's the point that he at, at, which is the key. Which is yeah. the key. I think Cadmus Hood's Wilcox. one of the best commanders. Yeah, I you think, like I Wilcox. think William Dorsey yeah. Pender. William Dorsey Pender, at least here at Gettysburg, you've got to put and look at what Lee has to say about these people when he's yeah. losing their best commanders and what he says about them. So certainly here, I think they're high on the list. But obviously. With Hood, you, you, you know, he gets moved up. So I guess the question is when? Do they yeah. stay that way or that do they not stay that way? Who, who yeah. peaked at what level, I guess? That's right. I guess that's that. how you would, have to th yeah. you would have to think about it. So then yeah. it really becomes an interesting talk about the character of the individual who can yeah. go ahead and rise up and fall back. We got George Sears Green, who's a wonderful brigade commander, but he's already been a division commander. Right. John Gibbon is a wonderful division commander, but he's able to step up and be an acting corps commander. So it really does go to what position when, and those certainly were talented people. Uh, we were starting to get into this Peter Principle idea that yeah. takes place here on Battlefield. Maybe Hood or yeah. something, yeah. Yeah, the idea that, hey, you know, both sides are looking for leaders, and so they're going to promote people as they need to, and eventually you'll get promoted to your level of incompetence. And that Peter Principle is massively in effect on all Civil War battlefields. Up to a third of the people serving on any one of these battlefields is serving in a level of command they've never served at before. I mean, here at Gettysburg, we take, uh, you know, William Perry in South Carolina. You know, in Fredericksburg in December, he's a company commander. He's responsible for 35 people. At Chancellorsville in May, he's a regimental commander responsible for 350. Here at Gettysburg, he's a brigade commander responsible for 1,500. What prepares him from December to July to go from commanding 35 to 1,500? That's a tough effort. That really is. And it really is, and it's one of the things after this battle, when Lee is talking about uh, the, sh the condition of his army after the fight, He's not going to talk about the loss of his senior generals that really bothers him. Uh, especially in 1864, he'll talk about the company grade officers right. that he lost here at Gettysburg, not just because of they're, they're not there to command their companies, but they're not there to command regiments and, and go above right. that. If you take a look at the losses here at Gettysburg, there are only two regiments in the Union Army, the 24th Michigan and the 120th New York, that lose as many as eight officers killed or mortally wounded. But if you take a look at like the 11th North Carolina, they lose their major and 15 lieutenants killed in this God. battle. Wow. How do you bounce back from that? And what, what are the ripple effects in that regiment, in that brigade, and, and farther on And look at the Pettigrew's line? brigade. The, the report is, is filed by like a major, right? Because yeah. all the senior officers, unfortunately for I them, mean, there's not even killed or wounded. Not there's even not a colonel left in a brigade. Yeah, that's rough. Well, that's how you have William Henry Lawrence, uh, Lawrence commanding what had been Scales' right. brigade right. Yeah. on July 3rd. Right. Right. Basically, everybody's going, Right. Yeah, I, I'm going I'm to get ready to wrap this up, but I want to talk about one reverse Peter principle, see if you agree at all, because a lot of people talk about how William Mahone was sort of an <laughs> average brigade commander, and then all of a sudden you give the guy a division and he's a hero. You know, the guy, you know, there's not too many people that work that way. That's a great point. It's a really great point. It's almost unexplainable to understand how somebody with lesser responsibility, lesser authority, seems to do better with more. Yeah, I know. But I guess in the business world, it's that way too. Once in a while, you come across somebody like that. Then yeah. I think you need to look at the staff. I'd love to know who, who who's point. working for him, yeah, yeah, I yeah. guess. Yeah. I good mean, point. Very I mean, good Because point. I think that probably is going to come down to some of that. Yeah. All right, one last question on this before we wrap up with, with some announcements. But, you know, it's one thing to talk about the Robert E. Lees and Albert Sidney Johnstons and U.S. Grants of the world. But if you could get one commander from any of our early eras to sort of go off on an independent command, command an army, but you're looking for an on the ground commander, not the grand strategist, but someone who's going to fight a battle. Um, who comes to mind? Uh, in, at what level now? Any level? Uh, any level, but it's going to be independent army fighting a battle, not big campaign in the army. You want someone in, in, in there fighting a battle. Anybody come to mind? How about George Thomas? But Thomas is a corps commander, right? What about yeah, George but, Thomas? Yeah, but you know, but he, he's got an army for part, some time yeah, at does. least, yeah, a little, right. and twice, I guess. Yeah. I, yeah. I Sherman would be hard to argue against. You know, he's able to take direction from higher, even if he doesn't agree with it. He seems to work uh, joint operations, working with both the Navy. He uses yeah. combined arms really well. He's thoughtful. 
almost to the point of being a micromanager, however you want to view that, but attention to detail is certainly not one of his yeah. shortcomings. Thomas would be a good number two to somebody, I yeah. think. But well, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in with, you know, you know, Jackson, just Stonewall Jackson might have arguably done better sometimes when he wasn't he under Robert E. Lee, like on the peninsula right. or something like that. They did well at Chancellorsville, I guess, but, yeah. you know, you look at him in the valley, like he's off doing his thing, whereas Longstreet really wasn't that good. I guess I kind of discounted Lee at the beginning, but, man, you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody better than Lee on the ground to fight a battle, too, so that's really interesting. Well, it's a great point, and then you start to get to, and we were just kind of touching about it, about, hey, what are those people all below? And really, this is the problem for both of these armies is how well do those senior people that are very good, how do they prepare people that are underneath them to take command? We see Grant and Sherman trying to do this with McPherson out in the Western Theater. How are they preparing other people to take their place when they are gone? Which is ultimately one of the things that all commanders are tasked with. Accomplish a mission, take care of your people, and train your replacement. And so the people who are very good at it seem to go ahead and provide longevity to their organization. People who are bad at it, Jackson yeah. seemed to not be able to provide. His genius dies with himself, and nobody else is the beneficiary of it. Take a, a look point. at General Buford on the first day at Gettysburg. He has two officers who he's been mentoring, Devin and Gamble. He has responsibility for covering from the York Road all the way down to the Fairfield Road. He personally cannot oversee all of it. So he stays with Gamble, the junior officer, and gives Devin the authority uh, to handle the stuff that's out oh, of yeah. Buford's building direct line of sight that he can do that with confidence because he has mentored them and gotten them ready for that moment good good well i think we should leave it there y'all um i want to thank you all for joining us again wayne mott's national civil war museum in harrisburg pennsylvania carol reardon doug downs this has been a great day we're going to be back live tomorrow on several occasions unconfirmed reports suggest that we might be talking about battlefield preservation about civil war photography about the greatest charges of the civil war and other wars and presidents of the civil war and then join us wednesday morning uh sometime around 9 30 we'll shoot for that for our big live civil war news uh, uh nerd quiz not news quiz nerd quiz there will be prizes uh, uh there are no rules the points don't matter but we're gonna <laughs> award prizes um, along the way and man we got some good stuff so we'll be looking for your answers um as we go along on that go to battlefields.org look to see what the american battlefield trust is really working on thanks to james andy and chris behind the camera and thank you all for watching and of course for supporting battlefield preservation